everyone to the latest installment of CADCA's Research into Action webinar series. My name is Katrina McCarthy, and I'm a member of CADCA's Evaluation and Research Team. If you haven't previously participated in one of our webinars, the purpose of this webinar series is to introduce coalition members and substance misuse preventionists to current and relevant research being conducted in the substance use and community coalition fields. I'm joined for this installment by Sue Thaw and Carolina Deuce. They will present on CADCA's publication, Practical Theorist Number 12, Cannabis, the Current State of Affairs. And we'll discuss everything you need to know about cannabis and how coalitions can address cannabis sale and use in their communities. So now I'd like to introduce our presenters, Sue Thaw and Carolina Deuce. Sue Thaw is a public policy consultant representing Community Anti-Drug Coalitions of America. She is nationally recognized for her advocacy and legislative accomplishments on behalf of the substance abuse prevention field. She has an extensive background in public policy and has held high positions at the federal, state, and local levels. She was a budget examiner and legislative analyst at the Office of Management and Budget in the Executive Office of the President for over 10 years. Sue was a driving force behind the passage, reauthorization, and full funding of the Drug-Free Communities Act. In addition, Sue has worked to save and enhance funding for all federal substance abuse prevention and treatment programs over the last two decades. She is highly respected as an expert on demand reduction issues by members of Congress and staff on both sides of the aisle on Capitol Hill. Sue has an undergraduate degree from Cornell University in Human Development and Family Studies and a master's degree from Rutgers University in city and regional planning. Carolina Deuce is an evaluation and research manager at Community Anti-Drug Coalitions of America. She made significant contributions to the publication of this practical theorist. She moderates the Research into Action webinar series and evaluates CADCA's training events. She has a master of arts degree in international relations and international economics from John Hopkins University and undergraduate degrees from American University. Now I'll go ahead and turn it over to the presenters to discuss their work. Thanks, Katrina. It's a little surreal to be on this side. Usually I'm the one introducing the presenter, but I'm honored to have this opportunity to speak with you all about cannabis. I'm so excited to tell you about CADCA's latest practical theorist, Cannabis, the Current State of Affairs, which we launched in July of this year. Our partners at NIDA, NIH, and DHHS supported CADCA's work in producing this publication. During the webinar, Sue and I will talk about modes of use, how cannabis affects the body, youth use, impaired driving, and how coalitions can address cannabis sale and use in their communities. Cannabis originated in Central Asia, but is now grown in temperate and tropical climates around the world. THC and CBD are the two most well-known cannabinoids, but there are hundreds of other chemical compounds that are less well studied. If you remember from high school biology, most plants have flowers containing both male and female parts and require pollinators to help with fertilization. There are also some plants such as squash that have separate male and female flowers found on the same plant, and there are other plants like cannabis that have entirely separate male and female plants. Cannabinoids like THC are produced at the highest levels in the buds of female plants right before fertilization. The leaves and stems of female plants and the entire male plants also contain low levels of THC. Cannabis containing very low levels of THC in the female plants are called hemp. According to the 2018 Farm Bill, hemp must have less than three-tenths of a percent THC. THC is responsible for most psychotropic effects of cannabis, so when we talk about potency, we're talking about percent THC. It's really important to note that cannabis today is much more potent than it was in the 90s or even earlier. Compare 4.8% THC in buds, that's only the female flowers I was mentioning in the previous slide, in the 90s to on average 19.6% THC in buds in Colorado in 2017. Even the potency of shake and trim, that's the leaves and stems of female plants and the entire male plant, uh, in 2017 is much higher than buds in the 90s. 
Data regarding cannabis seized by the DEA mirrors the data coming out of Colorado regarding potency. Concentrates, which are formulated as waxes or liquids, have on average 68.6% THC in Colorado in 2017, but can have up to 90% THC. Consumption of concentrates is very concerning, considering the high amount of THC in these products. Concentrates are made by extracting the THC from all parts of male and female plants. There are three main methods of getting cannabis into the human body, but the most common is inhalation. As you can see from these pictures, cannabis users have devised many ways to inhale cannabis. Joints, blunts, which are hollowed out cigars filled with cannabis, and various pipes have all been around for a long time and are the most common modes of use. Vaping and dabbing are more recent developments involving concentrates. There are now companies that sell cartridges containing THC in the e-liquid for various ENDS devices. The CDC found that most patients diagnosed with e-cigarette or vaping product use associated lung injury in 2019 had vaped THC. Dabbing is another method in which concentrates, often butane hash oil, are placed on a hot nail and then evaporated concentrates are inhaled through a water pipe in one puff. There are significant dangers from home production of butane hash oil, and ER visits have been documented due to explosions and fires. Ingestion is the next most common method of getting cannabis into the human body. As you can see, there's now a wide variety of foods and beverages infused with THC. The two beverages listed here concern me more than the snacks because they contain alcohol and caffeine, chemicals that can interact with THC and may produce different effects than a product that contains only THC as the active ingredient. Inconsistent dosing among servings in a package or between different products can create challenges for users and for public health officials. For instance, if one serving as determined by the manufacturer, uh, right now the FDA doesn't regulate these products be because cannabis is illegal at the federal level, so some states are stepping in, um, but a lot of times the manufacturer is the one determining what a serving is of their product. So if a serving is a quarter of a cookie, it doesn't necessarily mean that the THC is distributed evenly throughout the whole cookie. Accidental ingestion by children or unsuspecting adults is also a serious concern. However, despite these problems, um, some cannabis users prefer edibles because there isn't uh, the telltale smell of smoking cannabis and there's also no harmful lung effects related to ingesting cannabis. Topical creams and ointments are also gaining in popularity and may contain THC or CBD or both. Users of these products tend to believe they have some kind of medicinal or skincare benefit. However, there's limited to no support for those claims. This leads me to a quick discussion of cannabidiol or CBD. This compound is found in cannabis, but doesn't have intoxicating or addictive effects like THC. Despite widespread proliferation of CBD products marketed for therapeutic or medicinal uses, there's insufficient research regarding its effectiveness in treating any of those ailments. The FDA has not approved the use of CBD in medical products, dietary supplements, or food products with the exception of the drug Epidiolex, although hemp and hemp seed oil can both be used in food products. Synthetic cannabinoids intend to mimic the effect of THC. There isn't much incentive as of yet to produce synthetic versions of CBD or other lesser known cannabinoids. Some common names include spice and K2, and these synthetic cannabinoids are manufactured as powders that are added to plant material and smoked. Users report more harmful lung effects and more negative effects while high when using uh, these synthetic cannabinoids versus regular cannabis, but they use it because it's not detectable in drug tests because there's so many different formulations. Next, let's talk about what happens in an individual's body when they take cannabis. It's important to note that there are differences depending on the mode of use in the first few steps. The first stage is consumption, either by inhalation or ingestion. It's a pretty straightforward stage, and I discussed the different ways that cannabis can be consumed in the previous slides. Uh, the second stage, absorption, is where you can really see the difference between the modes of use. 
For inhalation, THC is absorbed into the bloodstream in the lungs and reaches peak concentration in three to 10 minutes. On the other hand, when an individual ingests cannabis, THC is absorbed in the intestines and metabolized in the liver before passing into the bloodstream. Because digestion and metabolization both take time, peak concentration of THC occurs in three to eight hours, and that's compared to three to 10 minutes for inhalation. The third stage is distribution. THC is carried by the bloodstream to cannabinoid receptors in the brain and nervous system. Eventually, in the fourth stage, the intestines metabolize THC to prepare for the fifth stage, elimination. Because THC is fat soluble, it can either be stored in fatty tissue in the body, or it must be metabolized into some other water-soluble compounds to be eliminated. The THC stored in fat cells can be released in exercise or weight loss a long time after cannabis was originally consumed. The third stage distribution is mainly when the acute effects of cannabis occur. Let's talk about them. Euphoria is of course the most well-known effect and the main reason many people want to use cannabis. However, there are many other acute effects and they are not positive ones. Cognitive functions, including verbal learning and memory, attention, and decision-making are impaired by cannabis use. In addition, users can expect incoordination, poor psychomotor performance, increased blood pressure, and risk of adverse cardiovascular effects. Overdose in the traditional sense is unlikely because cannabis doesn't target the part of the brain that controls respiration like alcohol and opioids do. However, overconsumption can lead to a psychotic reaction or a panic attack. Cannabis use is also characterized by some long-term effects. Those with heavy use in adolescence or with early age of initiation or with use of high potency products are at increased risk for psychosis. Long-term use is associated with persistent decreased cognitive function and it can even persist after cessation of use among individuals who initiated use in adolescence. Because the endocannabinoid system is involved in adolescent neurodevelopmental processes, use during adolescence can disrupt crucial brain development. Finally, cannabis smokers are at greater risk for bronchitis and poor lung function, particularly if they also use tobacco. The FDA has approved three cannabinoid-based medications and a fourth already approved in the EU is under review. You can read about them more in this table. Uh, there are no other approved cannabis-based medications or other diseases or symptoms that cannabis has been proven effective to treat. Researchers have identified a long list of medical conditions for further investigation. However, few studies have been conducted so far, and many of them are not randomized controlled trials in humans with a sufficient number of participants. In addition, there's often inconsistencies regarding the use of a standard dose and preparation of cannabis within some studies and also across different studies. There are studies where dosage and method of consumption are not mentioned. Studies with inconsistent dosage and mode of use or with insufficient number of participants or with animal subjects or where participants self-report whether cannabis is effective for their ailment are not reliable indicators of whether cannabis is an effective treatment. Cannabis is addictive. According to the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, fifth edition, cannabis use disorder is defined as cannabis use that meets at least two to three of 11 criteria. These criteria are the same criteria as for other substance use disorders, craving, tolerance, withdrawal, and so on. It's important to note that again, use in adolescence carries higher risks. Dr. Nora Volko and colleagues found that individuals who initiate cannabis in use in adolescence are more likely to develop cannabis use disorder than those who initiate use as adults. Since youth use carries heightened risk of adverse effects such as disrupted brain development, persistent cognitive deficits, and addiction, let's talk more about youth use. You can see from this chart that in the past 30 years, lifetime cannabis use among youth peaked in the mid to late 90s and has hovered around 30% for all grades in the green line and just above 40% for 12th grade, that's the red line, for the past 15 years or so. 
6.4% of 12th grade students reported daily use in the past month, and adolescents whose parents have used cannabis within the past year are at greater risk of using cannabis themselves than adolescents whose parents have never used cannabis. Um, this study by Dr. Madras and her colleagues really demonstrates the important role parents have in um, their children's lives and especially their children's decision making regarding substance use. As we all know, there are many min misconceptions out there about cannabis and youth are definitely not immune to um, believing some of them. This chart shows the precipitous drop in perception of great risk, that's the red bars, of using cannabis one to two times weekly from 34% of youth ages 12 to 17 to only 15% of 18 to 25 year olds. And the proportion of young adults who perceive no risk, that's the gray bars of using cannabis regularly is double the, the proportion of adolescents. This is a grave issue for coalitions to address. Additionally, an online survey of youth with lifetime cannabis use found that 94% of respondents did not think cannabis is addictive. This belief is particularly pernicious because, as I mentioned earlier, those who initiate cannabis use as adolescents are more likely to become addicted to it than those who initiate cannabis use as adults. Cannabis, the leftmost bar in this chart, is the substance that the lowest proportion of youth aged 12 to 17 view regular use of as a great risk. And we're looking at the red bar segments. In addition, you'll notice that the gray bar segments, that at least three times as many youth perceive no risk of regular cannabis use as for the other listed substances, such as heroin, cocaine, binge drinking, and smoking. Inhalation is the most common mode of cannabis use among youth, and almost all youth who have used cannabis have smoked it. However, if you look at the red bar segments again for great risk and compare cannabis at the far left to tobacco at the far right, you can see that youth are not connecting the perceived harms of smoking cigarettes with smoking cannabis. That's a problem because there are harmful effects to the lungs associated with smoking cannabis regularly, but also because youth who use cannabis are much more likely than youth who do not to also use tobacco products. And I'll turn it over to Sue to discuss the effects of cannabis use on academic performance and also impaired driving and how seven strategies can be applied to cannabis um, prevention in your community. Well, hi everybody. I'm really excited to be part of this webinar today. Um, so I'm going to start by talking about Surgeon General Jerome Adams' um, advisory on marijuana use in the developing brain, especially given the risks to pregnant women and adolescent brain development. Um, and we were very excited that um, this Surgeon General's advisory came out saying that marijuana use really is contraindicated for both adolescents and pregnant women in no small part because marijuana use during adolescence is associated with changes in um, the areas of the brain involved in attention, memory, motivation, and decision-making, uh, all of which end up impairing adolescents' ability to learn and do well in school. Um, chronic and early persistent marijuana use is linked to declines in IQ, um, dropouts, and also jeopardizing professional and social achievements and life satisfaction overall. Um, in addition, we see um, associations with marijuana use with uh, rates of school absence and dropout as well as suicide attempts. Um, next slide, please. Um, so I'm going to spend some of the next few slides really talking about cannabis use and um, academic performance at the college level. Um, we, we just saw that for adolescents in high school, your chances of dropping out go up precipitously if you're an early persistent marijuana user. But how about, how about in college? So marijuana use during the first year of college was associated with an increased likelihood of skipping classes or declines in GPA. Um, and next slide, please. And 
this is somewhat old data, but it's the most recent data that we have on um, use among college age students in 2015. About 38% of college students indicated that they would used marijuana in the past year, up from about 30% in 2006. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the next slide is um, a study that is longitudinal that's been done by Dr. Amelia Aria at the University of Maryland. Uh, she's looked on an ongoing basis at uh, what happens with college students who have relatively high levels of marijuana use, which um, is determined as about 17 days a month. So this is not daily use, it's um, about using every other day. Uh, and comparing those students with those with minimal use, less than one day a month, and looking at um, did they drop out of college or did they have an enrollment gap, meaning that they took more than four years to graduate. Um, Next slide, please. And why would that matter? Well, other than buying a house, paying for college is one of the most costly things that um, people go into debt for, both for their children and people themselves. And so the average cost of a four-year college degree is about 92,000. But if it takes you six years to get out of college, um, that goes up to about $139,000. So next slide, please. So obviously, parents should really care and talk to their children and get involved um, in not thinking that marijuana use is a rite of passage because marijuana use can certainly hurt your child's IQ, grades, and ability to graduate high school. But when it comes to college, uh, your child's marijuana use, especially if they're using about 17 days a month, could derail their college career and be very costly if it takes six or eight years to get out of college as opposed to four. Um, next slide, please. Marijuana use definitely impairs driving. There's a myth out there that marijuana makes people somehow better drivers or that it's safer to drive um, under the influence of marijuana than under the influence of alcohol. And all of these are myths that really truly need to be dispelled. Um, marijuana is active chemical THC affects weaving within a road lane, similar to the way a blood alcohol level of 0.08 affects people. Marilyn Eustace, who unfortunately is no longer at NIDA, she was previously at NIDA, is one of the world's leading experts on marijuana impairment and driving. And she's quoted as saying, one of the things that we know happens with cannabis is that it reduces your field of vision. So basically you get tunnel vision and you can't see what's happening on either side of you, really just in front of you, and you're not able to react very quickly. And these are two of the reasons that I'm going to show you in a minute that um, marijuana use is associated and correlated with major increases in the number of car accidents and fatal car accidents where people die. Uh, next slide, please. This is a roadside survey that's somewhat old, but it is fascinating. So um, th this is, they actually tested people for what was uh, in their systems. And on weekdays, about 22.4% of people who were stopped and tested, tested positive. Um, and of that, marijuana is about half of it. But look on weekdays, alcohol is only about 1.1%. On weeknight, weekend nights, excuse me, uh, about the same number of people tested positive, marijuana goes up, and these don't add to 22.5%. We're seeing poly substance use here. Marijuana, again, is more than half of it, but alcohol goes up on weekends. Um, so the two things here are one, we're seeing the combination of marijuana and alcohol, which Carrie explained exponentially increases your impairment. Um, but we're also seeing that the marijuana use in this roadside survey stays basically, it goes up a little on weekends, but it's because people who are using marijuana are usually using a lot more than people who are sort of drinking on the weekends. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so a study conducted by the National Cannabis Prevention and Information Center found nearly 70% of recent 
marijuana users had driven well under the influence of the drug. 16% said they'd driven on a daily basis less than five hours after using. And of course, one of the big problems is that people who are um, under the influence of marijuana are oblivious to the negative effects it has on their driving. In fact, many think that they're better drivers when they're under the influence. Um, so they have a perception problem where they don't realize that they're a risk to themselves and others on the highway. Uh, next slide, please. So drivers who tested positive for THC were 2.8 times, almost three times more likely to be culpable for an automobile accident. Drivers who combined THC and alcohol were 21 times more likely to be culpable for an accident. So think of that roadside survey and the percentage of people on the weekends who are using alcohol and also using THC really scary. Uh, and drivers who use THC are less able to control their vehicles. They have reduced ability to respond to unexpected situations. And of course, that's one, because they're impaired overall, but two, because of what I told you about their having tunnel vision, they can't see what's happening on either side of them. Uh, next slide, please. So chronic uh, cannabis users have poor cognitive performance, even when they're not currently intoxicated and chronic heavy cannabis use is associated with worse driving performance even when the driver is not actually intoxicated. So we know, as Carrie said, marijuana hangs around in the fatty tissues of your brain. Um, next slide, please. So those of you who have uh, worked with CATGA, been trained by CATGA, know that we um, train everybody to use the strategic prevention framework. And when it comes to um, actually doing your implementation plan, to use CATGA's seven strategies for community change against any of the local conditions that you're facing in your community. So that would be absolutely no different for marijuana than it is for any other substances. And it would be no different for marijuana um, that you would use the seven strategies regardless of where your state or community is with regard to uh, whether you've commercialized marijuana in your state, you have some sort of quote medical marijuana or there's been no policy change whatsoever. Regardless of where your state or community is, when it comes to having a strategy on how to deal with marijuana use, you still need to look at implementing things across all of CATCA's seven strategies for community change. So of course, the first one is providing information, raising awareness, doing social media messaging. Um, this is what most people think of as prevention, but it's just one of the seven strategies. Building skills. Um, providing peer refusal skill training, uh, teaching parents, teachers, and pediatricians on recognizing signs and symptoms of cannabis use and how to intervene um, and how to refer kids who need treatment to treatment as well. Providing support, uh, collaborating on student-led initiatives, uh, cannabis-free initiatives, Changing access and, um, and barriers. This one is important, really collaborating with schools and others to make sure that you're monitoring what's going on um, and have um, you know, access to help for people who are, um, who are using. Changing consequences and incentives. This one would be really recognizing students who choose not to use and also safe homes initiatives where parents sign up to, um, to pledge that they will supervise all parties and social gatherings at their home to make sure that no alcohol, marijuana or other drugs are being used. Um, changing physical design um, can include restricting the sale and display of cannabis paraphernalia, rolling papers and pipes. And to me, number seven is, of course, changing, modifying policies. One of the most important ones here to me is no matter what is going to happen with changing policies, ensuring there's local control, ensuring that if 
you um, are facing a legislative initiative or a ballot initiative to commercialize marijuana, that it absolutely includes communities being able to opt out of having uh, stores, grow sites, and dispensaries. If you already have one of these um, supporting ordinances to restrict hours of sale um, and updating clean air laws to make sure that they include cannabis. Um, next slide, please. So, thank you. So, all of that said, and this is the reason to me that local control becomes so important. Um, a study was just done in June 2020, just released. So are the lessons from tobacco control being incorporated into city and county laws regulating um, commercialized marijuana in California? So this study was a cross-sectional study of about 539 California cities and counties. Um, and what they found was the key public health recommendations and lessons that we've learned over so many years from tobacco control to reduce demand and prevent youth marijuana use have generally not been adopted. They've been totally ignored when it comes to implementing commercialization of marijuana. Next slide, please. So what you can see here is, and this is where local control becomes really important. 49% of California jurisdictions allow retail sale of marijuana, which would mean that 51% have been able to opt out. Those 49% of California jurisdictions cover about 57% of the state population. So here's what this study found. No jurisdiction, not one of the 539 um, jurisdictions required warnings on advertising. None of the jurisdictions limited potency of the products sold. Only one jurisdiction prohibited the sale of flavored products. <clears throat> Excuse me, five prohibited discounting. Only eight imposed restrictions on products that exceeded state regulations. 27 allowed on-site on consumption. 53% didn't tax it locally and 81 jurisdictions allow sales by delivery only, which is such a problem because the people who come to the door don't necessarily check IDs. Um, you don't even have to leave your house to, to get it. Um, okay, next slide, please. So I guess I'm gonna turn it over for the question and answers. Yes, all right. So we will go ahead and begin with that. Um, Katka will go ahead and ask Sue and Carolina several questions, and then we will turn it over to participants to ask their own questions. So if you have a question for the presenters, please go ahead and type it into the Q&A box if you haven't done so already, while I go ahead and start the Q&A session with these questions. So the first one, what are the most important steps <clears throat> a coalition can take to regulate cannabis sales and use in their community if their state has legalized use? I'm gonna, um, gonna take that. To me, again, one of the most important things is to ensure that there's some, or there is local control, that you can, in fact, decide that uh, your town does not want marijuana selling locations in the town. If that doesn't work, because either the way that the initiative of the law was written is that you can't opt out or you end up um, not, not winning that one. It becomes increasingly important to limit the hours of operation, to disallow home delivery, to disallow um, on-premises and around-premises use, and the siting of stores away from schools, churches, playgrounds, and other places um, that, that children would congregate or see the advertising. Um, you know, it's interesting. <laughs> the marijuana industry claimed they weren't gonna advertise if it got commercialized. And then as soon as anyone tried to stop it, they were like, well, it's a first amendment right of free speech to be able to do it. But there's another study we didn't include in this PowerPoint that we will have available if you want it about how if kids live near a dispensary and they see the advertising or they see a lot of advertising on social media, they're much more likely 
to try marijuana and to use it more often. So um, trying to get rid of signage and advertising would be another important step. Carrie, do you have anything you'd like to add? Um, no, I don't think so. Everything you've said about this is great and I think very important. As you said, the main thing is to have communities have the ability to opt out from the beginning. All right, thank you very much, guys. Um, we'll move on to question two. What are the most important facts about cannabis that coalitions should use to inform members of their communities? What about for elected officials? So I'm gonna take that one. Obviously, potency is the gigantic thing here. For anybody who has not been in the marijuana scene for the past two or three years, they have absolutely no idea what is really going on with um, the fact that this is not the same drug as it was before. It's the equivalent of a red silo cup of beer and a red silo cup of 180 proof grain alcohol. Um, and I don't think that most adults understand that, especially if they're not involved in the marijuana scene. So the fact that higher potency marijuana is what people are using, the potencies on some of this stuff can go up to really almost 99.9%. .9%. And, and I'm going to call this the okay boomer thing. Um, elected officials are passing laws and making policy based on not understanding anything really about the potency, the effects on the adolescent brain, the effects on pregnant and postpartum women. And to me, those are the most important facts that we can share with, with people. Uh, Carrie, again, would you like to say anything about this question? Sure. I second potency as really important, but I think another thing is to um, be very clear about what the effects are of using cannabis, because I think a lot of people, I mean, and this ties into potency as well, because it's more potent, the effects are stronger now, but I think it's important to look at, you know, the effects on the adolescent brain. That is very important information, I think, for both members of your community and also elected officials uh, to know about. And then also, um, I think just information about impaired driving. The misconceptions about impaired driving are truly dangerous. Alcohol and cannabis use at the same time. Um, and then driving, it just, as Sue pointed out, they're, they're 21 times, I think Sue said, more likely to get into a car accident. And we don't want people on the roads driving and under the I, influence of both of these. So there's something in the chat that I totally agree with. Youth are our most important messengers about any of this. They're the ones we should be using to the maximum extent possible to inform adult members of the community and elected officials about what's going on with youth, what they're using, what the effects of they're using it on, on their school performance, on um, the host of factors. So thank you for whoever put that in the chat. I, I agree 100%. All right, thank you so much for those answers. Uh, we'll go on to this last question. Where can interested coalition members find more information about this practical series? Uh, what other resources can you recommend for coalitions interested in addressing youth cannabis use in their communities? So I'm going to take that one. Um, first of all, you can find this Practical Theorist available to download on the CATCA website. We're also, at the end of this webinar, when we send out the slides, we'll include a link for you to be able to download it. Um, and then the other places we recommend that you look for um, more information about cannabis. Um, the Surgeon General's recent advisory about cannabis use among adolescents and pregnant women. That's a really great resource. Um, NIDA's Drug Facts page. They have a lot of information on marijuana on that page, so you can check that out. Um, our partner, the CDC, they also have a portal on marijuana that you can look at. And then um, if you want data specifically about youth use, you can look at monitoring the future and the National Survey on Drug Use and Health. 
Um, there's reports from the 2019 data for both of those surveys out now, and I expect that, well, next year, the 2020 data is going to come out. Um, so those are all great places for you to look for more information about cannabis use. Carrie, can I add one thing? This is Sue. Uh, we have an amazing track of workshops with the world's most famous experts um, coming up at Forum. We're going to have Dr. Madras, um, Bob DuPont, Dr. Ronit Lev. We have fabulous, fabulous people um, that are going to be speaking on this topic at the CAT Forum in February. So we would love it if everybody would, uh, would sign up for that. It's going to be done remotely, but it's going to be fantastic. Yes, that's an excellent point. We always have sessions about cannabis at Forum. So definitely come to Forum and then or come to Mid-Year um, and you'll be able to get the latest information there. All right. Um, we will go ahead and go to the participants' questions. Um, once again, if you have any questions for the presenters, please go ahead and put it in the Q&A box now. Um, so let's start with our one of these. Are there studies done about the effects of cannabis on the lungs? Yes, um, actually. Um, and I, I have this in my big PowerPoint, but um, yeah, chronic marijuana use does affect the lungs similar to people who um, smoke tobacco. Um, there was one study that found that it maybe would improve lung capacity a little bit, but chronic um, use definitely degrades your lungs. And I would add on to that, um, a couple of years ago, I think it was in 2018, we did a research and action webinar with a researcher who did a study about this with rats. Um, now, as I said before, studies on animals are not as good as studies on humans, uh, but since then there have been studies on humans as well. Okay, thank you very much. Um, what is your opinion as to why young folks use and what are those underlying reasons, if any? This is Sue. I mean, I think that the perception of harm and social disapproval um, has gone down. I think that marijuana has been glamorized in the media, in movies, um, on social media, um, you know, especially marijuana vaping, which, you know, <laughs> According to Monitoring the Future, it was the second largest increase in the history of Monitoring the Future in one year, other than the year before was vaping generally, um, last year marijuana vaping. Uh, and I think because kids are thinking it's cool and they think that it's not addictive, it's not harmful, um, and uh, you know, what it, it, it's supposedly medicine, how could it possibly hurt you? It's a plant, it's natural. I mean, we're, we're up against a, a commercializing industry um, that's exactly, they are the tobacco and alcohol people um, and they've glamorized this. Carrie, would you like to weigh in? Uh, sure, I, I would just add that specifically, I think with it being medicine, I, one of the big misconceptions is that you know, cannabis can help with anxiety or maybe depression or with other mental health issues. And so I think you sometimes see that as a safer way than alcohol use per se to kind of self-medicate or deal with some of these mental health issues, um, which can be a problem because we know it, there's no research yet that shows that it does help with these kinds of well, issues. Well, and it exacerbates mental health problems such as anxiety and depression. <laughs> so in the end, you, you, it's, it's going to come back and bite you in the neck if that's what you're going to be using it for, especially, you know, the younger you are and the more persistently you use. All right. Um, next question. Uh, are there studies that isolate cannabis use from other factors such as trauma, abuse, family environments when considering stats like school absence and suicide attempts? 
Yes, actually, the um, the studies that were done by Dr. Amelia Aria and Bob Dupont on school dropout, they did control for socioeconomic race uh, and and other variables. Um, so yes, a number of the studies that have found these negative outcomes have controlled for those factors. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see, how do you work on an ordinance to, uh, to restrict sale and display of cannabis paraphernalia when the stores say it's for tobacco use only? Oh, that's interesting. Um, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I guess you'd have to figure out that you wanted to ban all uh, uh, tobacco and marijuana paraphernalia. We, we can put you in touch with um, one of our coalitions in California that actually did have a ban on, um, on all paraphernalia, including rolling papers. Um, bongs and other things that are used for tobacco as well. Um, so whoever asked that question, if you can get us your contact information, I will um, we'll put you in touch with people who have actually done that type of an ordinance. Okay, thank you very much. Um, the next one, do you have any, I know this is still recent, but do you have any data on the impacts of COVID and cannabis use among youth? No, I was actually, I was just talking to uh, Senator Feinstein's staff yesterday about the fact that it would be great to actually do some research on what's happening across the board with youth substance use and COVID. Uh, I don't know who's even looking at that at this point, um, but it would be very helpful to have. I, Carrie, I don't know if you've heard of anything going on with that. Oh, I haven't seen any data about that yet. I'm sure when they uh, put out the new monitoring the future data, well, it might have, they might have surveyed everyone too early for it to be in the 2020 data. That's what I'm thinking. And because, yeah, that's coming out the second or third week in December. I've talked to NIDA about that. Um, and it, they are based on school surveys. So the kids would have had to have been in school um, to have taken the surveys. So yeah, not sure, but we'll we'll actually get that out to everyone as soon as monitoring the future is available through coalitions online and other mechanisms. All right, thank you very much. Um, so, how is cannabis being tested on um, in the roadside test? Do we know that the driver is high on cannabis at the time of driving, or are there blood tests based on what is stored in the fat, um, which can be present present up for a month? Do you have any information on that? Yeah, so they're not testing the fat in the roadside survey. Um, just, just think about that for a minute. They're, they're definitely not testing the fat. Um, a lot of times they can do a saliva test or a, um, they sometimes do a blood test for that survey. But I think the issue with cannabis is, as you mentioned, that it doesn't exactly have a linear timeline for how long THC is in the bloodstream, the way that alcohol in the bloodstream has a timeline. And you can tell like from when you do the test, if it's at a certain point at this time, you can say they were impaired an hour earlier or at a different time in the past. I feel like I'm explaining this poorly, but um, the alcohol goes in a regular fashion as it leaves the bloodstream, whereas cannabis uh, doesn't follow a certain pattern like that. So it is difficult, I think, to tell from just a blood test like that if someone's impaired. Well, there is no level of, you know, THC impairment like there is for 0.08 for alcohol. So alcohol is water soluble, marijuana is fat soluble, that's why it hangs around. But as you saw from the slides that, that I presented, even chronic users who um, aren't, haven't used in a while, know that they're still impaired to some extent um, as far as a whole bunch of other factors. So, um, so anyway, and I, I think, that's related to the chronic effects of cannabis use on the brain rather than the fact that there's like cannabis in the fat oh, cells, right? 
Yeah, no, I, I, the, the thing is, if you're a, a daily user, chronic user, um, hard to tell levels of impairment. And from what I've heard and seen in the research, the 30 day stuff, yeah, if you use all, all, all the time and then you stop, maybe it'll still be hanging around. But for the most part, if you're not a chronic user, um, the, the marijuana that would show up enough to be detected is probably gone in much less than 30 days. And again, Bob DuPont is one of the world's experts on that and he will be speaking on that at the forum. And I think this is kind of the biggest challenge with regard to cannabis, uh, figuring out what that best roadside test would be and what the level we should set similar to the 0.08 for alcohol. So I think that's, and it's something that as far as I've read, you know, we haven't solved it yet, but it's definitely something that needs a lot more research so we can address this issue. Okay, thank you for those answers. Um, next one, are there any studies about cannabis and outlet density similar to alcohol outlet density? You know, I don't think so yet. I think it's very new to be studying those sorts of things. But I think that's the kind of research we need, especially in states like Washington and Colorado that have le had it legal for at least five years now. The, the one thing we do know in the states that have commercialized is that just as with alcohol outlets, they're much more dense in um, lower income and vulnerable neighborhoods. And that's exactly where um, a lot of these marijuana stores are being cited as well. Um, so it just compounds already um, vulnerable neighborhoods. So we already know that. All right, thank you. Our next question, um, this person's state will again be considering legalization and they wanted to know what data would you point to that demonstrates costs versus benefits of legalization? Well, the tax revenue everyone is claiming if you tax and regulate this like, you know, alcohol will do great, but um, the tax revenues have been minuscule um, in all of the states that have commercialized. And if you think about it, they, it takes money to regulate something. Regulation equals bureaucracy and everybody wants lower taxes, not higher taxes. So um, I think it's a myth that this is, you know, some answer to state and local budget problems um, because the external costs associated with trying to regulate it, car accidents, emergency room visits, and other issues are going to far outweigh any possible revenue benefits. Um, and again, we have slides on that from a bigger presentation. It wasn't included in this that we can get out to people. And, and frankly, um, Sam Smart Approaches to Marijuana has done an extremely good job of um, looking at the text the fact that the tax implications, it's just a spurious argument for doing this. I would add to that, that when the thing they don't consider when setting up the tax is that there's still going to be black market purchases that aren't being taxed. And so they're not collecting revenue on that use. And um, it, it didn't make it into the publication, but when I looked at this um, I saw in Nevada that after the first year of um, legalization, still the cannabis um, sellers, I don't know, cannabis dispensary, the association of dispensaries was saying that they think about 50% of sales were still occurring black market just because the cost with the tax was so much higher. And there's no consequences really given it's been commercialized and there's no penalties. So yes, the black market is thriving every place that's legalized, not just Nevada. Um, and it's because you can buy it much cheaper and uh, nobody is really paying any consequences 
for, for dealing. I mean, if you think about the amounts you're allowed to supposedly have for personal use, like one or two ounces, that's like enough joints to keep you high for a half of a year. And that's not, that's considered personal use, not intent to distribute anymore. So yeah, <laughs> it's a big problem. Okay. Um, this next question, um, do you actually have any suggestions for an educational presentation specifically on edibles and their dangers in a state where marijuana is not legalized? Gary? Yeah, I'm not, I'm trying to think if I know of like a resource specifically about edibles and I'm not sure I do. But I think the other resources we've mentioned probably have some discussion of edibles that you could try to look at and pull something together from. And again, we have more information that was in, than what was included in, in this. So we, we do have slides from other presentations um, that you can, could be useful. That's true. Feel free to email us if you have questions. Um, I put the evaluation at CACA.org email in the chat before. I'll put it in again. Um, and, you know, we may be able to follow up with you about questions that we are not sure of the answer right now. Or if we have other and more information on some of what you're looking for that wasn't included in this webinar. All right. I'm going to ask one more question. Um, what would be an, an ideal legal system look like? What would be an ideal legal system in light of no good models in the USA? You know, maybe public health model versus a commercial model. Um, just your, your general thoughts on that. Yeah, well, of course, I'm a backward thinking Neanderthal. So my thing would be that um, <laughs> there probably are no really great models because um, we do tax and regulate alcohol and it's the most abused substance. In fact, 52% of, you know, people 12 and older have used alcohol in the past month, um, you know, compared to now 11% or so of people using marijuana. So, um, you know, the more that you make this accessible, the more it's available um, and the more that you change social norms and lower the perception of harm and disapproval, the more likely you are to have a whole bunch more people using it. And that's exactly what we're, we're seeing, especially with 18 to 27 year olds. Um, so I don't know, my thing would be for me, um, we should try to limit this as much as possible, which I know didn't answer your question, but um, as you saw from what I presented from California for how they're not using anything we learned from tobacco and how it's marijuana is being regulated in California where they, you're not allowed to smoke indoors, but they're letting people consume marijuana on site. Um, we're not applying what we've learned from the two legal addictive substances to this particularly well at all. I don't know, Carrie, if you'd like to chime in. <laughs> no, I think you covered it. All right, thank you so much for answering those questions. I hope that was really helpful for all of the participants. Um, so I think we can just go ahead and wrap it up. Um, let's see, as I mentioned earlier, I will distribute the slides and the link to download the Practical Theorist to those who participated following this webinar. That email will also contain a short evaluation for this webinar, so please fill that out. If you would like a letter of participation, you will see a link to view and download it from the thank you page of the evaluation. You must fill it out, must fill out an evaluation to get the letter and you must download it right away um, so that you uh, can get it or else you will not get, be able to get back to it later. I will also post the recording of the webinar and the resources mentioned in the presentation and question and answer session on the CADCO website in the next week or so. I wanna go ahead and thank Sue and Carolina for their fantastic and comprehensive presentation on their work and their commitment to providing relevant and current material. Um, and thank you to webinar participants for your comments, questions, and insights.
Thanks everyone for listening. And I just wanna let you know that the next Research in Action webinar will most likely be in 2021. So keep an eye out in your inboxes for more information about that.